So, Bashar, thank you so much for driving all the way from Miami to Fort Lauderdale. I'm super excited to have you here today. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. So, as many of you guys can probably see, this is our very first episode, so I'm super excited to have Bashar on as the first guest. But um, what I just initially want to ask you is, like, why did you get started off with entrepreneurship? Like, what made you get become an entrepreneur? Um, it was, the first thing it was, um, my first inspiration was my father. Um, so he was like the, the, the person who was my role model, like first role model. Mm -hmm. So he was a successful entrepreneur back home in Iraq. Uh, he owned the second largest clothing factory in Iraq. And, um, and when I was little, the way that I would imagine him or the way that I would like look kind of like envision him in my mind it was always like uh like he was a mover he was a shaker he was someone that the community um respected and people came to him for advice and mm -hmm. that really like it felt really good to see someone so close to me that i can like look up to and like touch and feel and that felt good and so for the longest time i just wanted to be like my dad yeah that's amazing i wish i could say the same Dad, if you're watching this, uh, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, so you looked at your dad and that's who you wanted to be like. What was your first like entry into entrepreneurship? Because I know it was in this education business and I obviously no. know the answer, but I want to hear from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. No one has actually asked me that before. Okay. Got to do some thinking about that. Well, first of all, when I came to America, so this was in 2006, and prior to that, so I was, I was 16 years old when we migrated to the U.S., and prior to that, I don't think I had like, um, like a thought of entrepreneurship in mind, but I did know that I was destined for something big in life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how. Like, I could have become an astronaut. I could have become a doctor. I could have become anything. It wasn't right. like entrepreneurship, you know? I just know that like my father was like a role model, but I don't think necessarily, you know, like in my early teens, I thought of like, I want to become an entrepreneur. Mm. It was more of like, I just knew deep down that I was going to do something big. I didn't know what it was. But after I came to the U.S. and kind of like, like, uh, like the, 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 the door of opportunities opened up. The first, the very first thing was my mom convinced me to be a doctor. And so I started going to school, started studying biochem. And, uh, and like a few months into it, I was like, this is not, you know, I don't know <laughs> yeah, what the yeah. hell I'm doing right now. I still remember I would be sitting at the library and like a fly would go by a mile away and I would just like turn around. And I, and then for the longest time I thought I was, I really had a problem with focusing. Mm. And then for the longest time, I also used to call myself a procra procrastinator because I would literally not do my homework until the night before. Mm -hmm. And I'd always be like, why am I doing this? Why am I up until one o'clock in the morning doing homework where you know, I, I got the homework assignment like two weeks ago, you know, right. but it wasn't that I was uninspired or that, that I was procrastinator. I was just uninspired because the, the, the thing that I was doing was not inspiring me. And that's the reason why a lot of times now when I see people putting labels on themselves or putting labels on other people, yeah. I always am very cautious with that because you have to really look at the entire situation and figure out what is going on and why you're not getting the result that you want. Because it's very, oftentimes it has to do with the thing that's not interesting to you. It's not the fact that you, you know, you're, you're lazy or you're a procrastinator or you're this or you're that. Right. So after I came to America is when I really realized that, okay, there are so many things that I can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was around 2008. So I was about 18 years old now. Um, my father was about to be coming to the U S because he came a few years after we came to America and he was like, Hey, what can we do there as a business? Like he didn't speak the language, nothing. I mean, we, I didn't, right. I was only just a couple of years uh, ahead of him here. And, um, and I started looking into like franchise opportunities and I still remember I would like drive around literally drive around and I would like have a notebook next to me and I would write down anything that I could see, like a McDonald's, a Subway, whatever. And one time I even went to a 7-Eleven um, like franchise uh, seminar or something like that. There was like 30 people in there. I was 17 or 18. Yeah. Everyone was like 40 years old or whatever. And the, the facil facilitator came to me and was like, how old are you? I'm like 18. He's like, you do realize that you can't 
open a 7-Eleven unless you're 21, right? I was like, oh shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know Damn. that. But that's when I when I started getting a taste of like what entrepreneurship would look like and started actually becoming very interested. It was I was around like 18 years old or so. Got it. Yeah. So how did like how did you go from that to like your first business? Yeah. So um, for the first like 15, 16 years of my life, yeah. we looked very wealthy on the outside, but we were cash poor. Because my father, so again, my dad in like the 80s, early 90s, he was probably worth like tens of millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, the Gulf War on Iraq happened in 91. Yep. And the Iraqi dinar went from like one dinar equaling three US dollars to one US dollar equaling 1,200 dinars. So my dad's net worth literally from, went from like tens of millions to zero overnight. Damn. And so his business shut down. And for like 10 years, we had no cash flowing business. It was just, he had properties, he had acquired properties because he had wealth and he had bought things. We had a very nice home. We had, he had buildings in like downtown Baghdad, but we didn't have a cash flowing business. And for like 10 years, we were just like living hand to mouth, you know? And I remember one time I was in school and a friend of mine asked me, I don't know, it was so random. He asked me, he's like, do you, are you guys rich? And like, we were in like elementary school. Yeah. And I couldn't answer him because I was very confused. I'm like, are we or are we not? Because it looks like we are, but I only bought new clothes on Christmas. Yeah. I had a very tight budget that I could like buy just like a shirt, pants, shoes, that's it. Yeah. It was just from Christmas to Christmas. Um, I didn't have like an, uh, uh, an allowance. My mom used to always complain because she didn't have enough money to buy like enough groceries and stuff like that. Yeah. And things seemed to be tight. And I'm like, but we have this big ass house. And then we have all these things. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little confused. And I remember going to my dad and asking him, I'm like, dad, I got asked that school, are we rich? rich. (laughs) Yeah. And I remember him looking at me and I could see the disappointment on his face Mm. because again, he was like this, he was like the guy that everyone went to, you know, Mm -hmm. he's built his, his brothers like houses, put all of his, you know, kid brothers in in school, like all that stuff. You know what I mean? And now he can't provide. So I could like really see it on him, you know? Um, after the war in Iraq, everyone was thinking that everything's going to be great. And then things really went to shit yeah. for the first five, six years. Finally, he was able to liquidate some of his properties and get some money in. This was about 2008. So I was about 18, 19 years old. Yep. And that's when he came to America. So he brought some money with him. And we decided to start a family business. Okay. So we, that's when we bought a pizzeria. Mm. It was a local shop, like a, you know, like takeout and stuff like that. My dad at the time was in his 70s. My mom was like 65, 66, 60, you know, more like 62, 61, 62. My dad was probably like 72, 73. And then it was my brother and I. And we were working 24 7, well, not 24 7, you know, 80 hours a week, seven days a week, Mm -hmm. uh, open close. And this was the first time in my life that I actually worked that much. But now I had a business that I can control. Mm. And this was my first taste to my own business. And I was 20 at the time. So this was 2000. Got it. So you and your family decided to start up like a like a restaurant business right so because when we were speaking i remember you talking about how like you were learning to like grow a restaurant business and it just like i i actually love that story about how you were watching tv shows yeah, instead of seeking effort. mentors yeah yeah can you uh, share a little bit more about that <clears throat> yeah so i was about a, <clears throat> we were about a year into the restaurant yeah and i was trying to go out at 120 miles an hour my brother was trying to go out at like two miles an hour. Right. We had the same vision and our vision was, okay, we like this business. It's cool. I've only ran, um, up until that point, I had only worked at restaurants. I had my first job in America was, uh, at McDonald's in Detroit. And then when we moved to San Diego, I worked at another McDonald's with my mom. Um, and then I worked at a Greek restaurant for three years and then our pizzeria. Right. So that's all I knew. And I was like, you know, I like it. I like food and stuff like that. That's cool. So our plan was, we're going to buy up a few different shops and then we're going to kind of like get ideas, create like a uniformed um, like theme or a uniform like concept. Yeah. And then and then kind of like make a chain. And then over time, after we open like 20, 30 like uh, corporate places, then start franchising them. So this was the idea. That's what we wanted to do. Right. But I was ready to buy our second one by like month eight, nine. My brother wanted to wait. Mm. And then now we're a year in. I'm like, hey, bro, like I'm bringing all these places. I'm talking to realtors. I'm going checking out new places. I'm 20 years old at this time. Um, and he's like, well, let's wait a little bit, this and that. And at this point, he's the oldest here. 
my parents are relying on him. Everything is under his name. So he kind of has everything in control mm -hmm. and I have zero control. And then we started butting heads a lot. So that's when I was like, all right, guys, I'm out of here. You guys could do you. I'm just not I like I, I want to explode. I don't want to do all these things. But you guys don't want to evolve or don't want to do anything like that's not what I want to do. You know, um, at that point, again, my dad had liquidated some more properties. To that point, I was so I was born in 1990. Yep. My older brother was born in 1981. Nine years apart. Mm. My sister is 72. My oldest brother is 67. So there's 30 years between me and my oldest brother. Right. All the older ones were born into wealth. When ah, my dad had it all. Interesting. I was the only kid that was born when shit really just hit the fan. You right, know what I mean? Right. I feel like, I haven't confirmed this, but I feel like my dad felt obligated to provide me the kind of life that he provided to my other siblings. Right. So... When this whole thing happened, he transferred $200,000 into my bank account. And he said, this is your college fund. Your mom wants, me, wants you to become a doctor. You want to become an entrepreneur? Do whatever you want. I he trust just, you. He just sent you 200 grand. He just sent me 200 grand. And this was the last $200,000 he had. Got as it. A, like as a family, we had the business that was generated like seven, eight grand a month. Yeah. You know, we weren't really spending a whole, like we were saving $3,000, $4,000 a month from that business um, after all of our expenses. But this was the last money he had. He sent it over to me. He said, do you, Damn. you know, I trust you. And I was like, all right, I'm, um, uh, I'm how old be, were you at that time? Uh, 23, 22, 23. 23. Imagine being 22, 23 and yeah. just your dad just being like, yo, here's 200 grand. Yeah. Make sure you use it to go to college. Yeah. Well, he said, <laughs> do whatever you want. He said, either become an entrepreneur yeah. or go to college. Yeah. Right. And become a doctor like your mom wants you to do. Hmm. And, um, and I had a, I had a decision to make, man. And it was just it was just not school. I I changed my uh, major like six times in like a two three month period. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't find something that I can resonate with. But it wasn't that. I was just I was uninspired. And that's when I decided to to go into hey I know restaurants I'm gonna go into restaurants. I was like if I could eat, party, drink. I was 23. I was going out all the time. And make money at the same place? Like, holy shit. Hell yeah. This is like, <laughs> that's all I need, right? So I found a place uh, that had like a big opening so I can do like a dance floor and stuff like that. And um, rundown uh, restaurant used to be called the 67 Bar and Grill. It was on the 67 freeway. And that thing was rundown. I mean, that thing was rundown. Um, so we bought it. it was, I bought it for $200,000 cash. I transferred the whole thing. Now really? looking back at it, that thing was not worth more than fifty, seventy-five thousand. But the way that I was thinking was not what it's worth today, what it could be in the future. Right. And that's why I went all in. Again, twenty-three year old kid didn't know anything what the hell I was doing. Yeah. Um, I had been watching John Taffer, Bar Rescue, for about six months. Taking notes. Every time I watch, I take notes. I'm like, all right. So this is what he does. He brings a, uh, you know, a mixologist. He brings a chef into the kitchen. He does Wait, this. Wait, so that, that place had a liquor license and everything? Yeah, yeah, no, it was a bar. It was a running restaurant. It was oh, a running damn. restaurant and bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the other thing. It's that just the liquor license was worth about 85000 yeah, yeah, at yeah. that time in San Diego. Mm -hmm. But how much it was generating, you wouldn't buy that place for more than fifty, seventy-five. dollars right. right? Makes sense. So I was like, all right, you know, that, that's fine. I'm probably overpaying by fifty, seventy-five grand. That's cool. I know the potential, right? You know, and I, and I've got the knowledge that I can implement here to get it to where it needs to go, but I was very wrong. So what I, th I think I was, I don't know if you told me this or I was reading one of your emails that you sent out, but I think this brings us to the importance of proper mentorship. Mm. So what was your attitude towards getting mentors and paying for mentors? Because I know it's radically <laughs> different now. Well, first, I don't think I knew about the term mentors, you mm. know, or I understood what that meant. At the time, the, what I probably knew was consultants, right? And um, you couldn't tell me what to do because I knew it all. Ah. Because in my mind, it's like, look, you're able to figure this thing out and come charge me money. If you're able to do it, I'm able to do it. Because in my mind, I'm smart. I'm a genius, right? If anyone on planet Earth can figure it out, 
I can figure it out. Mm. Why the hell am I going to come and pay you money? And instead of me paying you money, I can put that money back in my pocket and I can invest it in blah, 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 blah. Right? More tangible More things tangible I can things. hold and feel. And that's the thing that I that I see with people. And, and you know, although that restaurant failed miserably, it took me a while after to finally make that switch in my mind. And then we were talking off camera, like the mindset shifts. Like this yeah. was one of the, probably the biggest things uh, until today. And some sometimes I find myself also struggling and it's like, hang on a second, what are you doing? No. We know what happened when you were thinking this way. Yeah. We know how where we went when we were thinking the other way. This is the way to do it, right? And it simply was about making the shift from I'm here to pay you to why am I going to pay you to, to give me something that I can go learn on my, by myself yeah. to no, you've done it before. You've gone through the trial and error. I would rather pay you to accelerate the learning curve. It's like reading a book. Mm. The author has gone through a decade or decades of their life and they're literally putting it in a book that you can buy for $10 or less. And I don't know. I mean, it depends on how fast you read. You could read it an hour, two hours, three hours, five hours. A decade and five hours, like that's a good deal, right? So for me, I, I didn't understand that. And there are until today, there are so many things that happen that I have a mindset shift. And then when I look back, because when you don't have that mindset shift, where you're sitting, you feel like this is the right thing, mm. right? And then when you make the mindset shift, you look back and you're like, wait a second, how the hell did I think that was right? But I believe it's it's all about awareness. That's where it all lies, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about awareness. How much awareness do you have? Like the reason why you're here and not here, it's just your level of awareness. That's all it is. And usually it's 80% psychology, 20% skill, mm. right? And so this is the thing that I really realized, like right now, especially over the last 12 years, I've been obsessed over skill, just skill building, you know, learning how to do this, learning how to do that, learning how to do that. But then just recently, like within the last six months, I realized that it's really 80% psychology and 20% skill. And that's when I started working more on my psychology than right. the actual skill that I have. And so going back to your question, no one could tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. I knew it all. I had all the answers. Um... I had a plan. I just had a plan until I did it. Okay. So how much did you invest in your personal growth in your psychology this year? Well, total, I mean, psychology, you could say about maybe like 250, between 220 to 250K. Damn. Um, in terms of entire investment, we're at a little over 610,000 this year. So you went from 20-year-old Bashar, believing he could do it all on his own. Why pay you? to give me, to make me learn <laughs> skills when I could learn it myself and then yeah. put this money back in my pocket to 600 grand this year. Yeah. And 20 year old Bashar, Mr. Know-it-all, making nothing. 30 year old Bashar, 2 million a month, openly investing, humble. So I mean, that, that's like, I think that's one of the tenets of like the wealthy mind. Yeah. Always being open and always being receptive to growing no matter what stage you're at. Right. Because I also find that whenever I close myself off and I think like, oh, you know, I know it all. Mm -hmm. I stay stuck. Mm -hmm. I never grow. Because if you're wanting to grow, you've got to open yourself up, right? And I think part of opening yourself up, like you mentioned, is like humbling yourself and kind of like even being vulnerable to, hey, I don't know this. Why would I like spend this much time figuring it out when I can hire an expert who's already done this to help me figure out, figure out my blind spots. You know, one, one interesting thing that I've also realized is for the longest time, as my business was growing, I also closed off myself, not just to mentors, but to relationships. Mm. Like when we first met, we were just like, you know, colleagues of the same group, yeah. you know? And then when I started kind of like, you know, when we started doing the monthly thing at my place and all that stuff, and then we started like hanging out more often, conversations would happen. Yeah. And literally, I would sit and have dinner for two hours, and someone would say a phrase, like five words. And those five words would like change the trajectory of my life and business over the following quarter, right? And so oftentimes, like people talk about how, well, I'm an introvert. I just don't like having conversations with people or whatever. And yeah. it's like, you know, I, um, we had a... Um, uh, we had a, um, we had a, a mindset coach that works with our students, and she's like, you do realize there's no such thing. 
like people, you know, some of our students would be asking our questions. Like, you do realize there's no such thing, right? Like, That's all what, these an things. Introvert? introvert. Mm. There's no introvert. There's no extrovert. There's no procrastinator. There's no, fo- I, I lack focus. There, all these things, like when you were born, yeah. you weren't born with all these things. Yeah, yeah, you were born a pure child with nothing. Yeah. And then over time, as time went on, as society, as you became exposed to certain things, you started labeling yourself certain things. Mm. And then you started seeing like, oh, okay, the person that acts kind of like me is labeled this thing. You know, like sometimes I'm, I still don't know if I'm an extrovert or I'm an introvert. And you'd be like, wait, you're on podcast. You're definitely an extrovert. Yeah. But then sometimes I'm like, no, but I sometimes avoid being like in public places. But other times I'm like, dude, I love being in public places. And I love talking. Yeah. Like when I spoke at Sam Oven's thing, yeah, right. I was nervous as shit. Yeah. This was the first time I ever spoke in front of people and I was nervous. Yeah. And I've gotten so many people asking me to speak on stage and, and I always make up some bullshit excuse. <laughs> but it's really because I'm like, uh, I don't know if I could do it. Right. It's a mindset block. So it's like, well, does that mean because I'm an extrovert? No, it doesn't mean anything. There's the whole thing. I, recently, I learned a concept of visionaries and integrators. And then usually visionaries are the ones that are out there. That are like, you know, in the spotlight. Integrators are the ones behind the, the, the currents kind of making things happen. Hmm. But then I've seen visionaries that have the mindset and have the, you know, but that are not very good at like creating new relationships. Integrators are the ones on stage and speaking to people and creating relationships. It's got nothing to do with labels or whatever. It's whatever you, all these things are things that you put on yourself, hmm. you know? And then what happens is when you start believing them, you become those things. Right. Right. That's like, an identity you form. 100%. Yeah. And then the identity that you form defines who you are, and then that's it. Now you're stuck with it. So that's why it's really important for us to be very careful with the labels that we place on ourselves. 100%. Because those, literally, a small label that you might not even think about, it's like, ah, oh, well, yeah, I'm an introvert, or whatever it is, Right. could be stopping you from so much opportunity that you're not even thinking about. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And that's why, like, we focus so much on the identity and yeah. helping you consciously craft who, who it is you need to become. Because, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this, but at different levels in your business, you've had to assume a different identity. It was 100%. never static to one thing. Right. Like right now, maybe you're working more on leadership and leading a team and inspiring other people. But before, you maybe had to put on your ad hat, your ad master identity, right. or your, you know, when you're making your course, your course master identity, right? So... I guess, like, did you ever, like, when you were, how can you see a difference in your identity from when you were 20 to running that restaurant business Mm. to right now when you have this multiple eight-figure business? Like, what do you think is the fundamental difference between those two identities? As I mentioned earlier, it's about awareness. Um, The more you become aware of everything, like I used to hear people talk, uh, say all the time, I'm very self-aware. And that was a a term I did not understand what it meant. And I recently became aware of what that meant. Um, The more awareness you have, and not just of like what you're doing, what you're saying, just everything, all of your surroundings, the better, I guess, outcomes you could have in your life. And this is with everything, you know. Um, I recently had to make a very tough decision in my business and simply had to let go a third of my company. Damn. You know, uh, like a a very, a very, uh, what's the word? A very... um, Cathartic moment. Yeah, and it was uh, like something that the entire company depended on. It was a branch of the company that the entire company depended on. And for the long like this decision needed to be made about four months ago Mm. the reason why it took me four months because in my mind i did not think that i can do it without that branch in the company or without the people in that branch in the company right right and then all that needed to happen and it was for the longest time i was just like dude i can't and then i was i was like putting up with it well we'll fix it we'll do this we'll try that we'll you know and then i was like I was like trying to take the punches and then just be, it's okay, you know, we'll make it work. Yeah. And literally it happened over a weekend that I made a mindset shift and I made an identity shift pretty much where I I went from, I got here because of this to I got here because of me. I built this, I can build something else. Cut, move on. Hmm. I woke up the next morning feeling like a mountain was lifted off my shoulders. Right. And it all started from within. And this is where uh, one of the reasons why I love Tony Robbins and his teachings, because the thing that he always talks about 
is that the reason why we start business, the reason why we get into a relationship, the reason why we have sex, the reason why we have children, the reason why we go on vacations, the reason why we do anything in our lives, it's because we want joy. We want happiness. We want fulfillment, mm. right? But oftentimes we're looking for things out there to bring this joy to us. Mm. You know, we want a bigger house, a nicer car, uh, more vacations. We want a, 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 a prettier partner. We want this, you know, uh, more behaved children, whatever. Yeah. But really the, the, the fulfillment and happiness always comes from within. Right. And if you're able to find that in every single situation, you can accomplish anything that you want in your life. Oh, right? 100%. And this is the one like mindset shift that I literally had within the last six months. Because I was also always looking for like external things. And I, although I always, pro, you know, I, I, I was like very proud in that I'm the type of person that's very humble. I don't like to spend things on luxuries. I don't like to buy expensive stuff. I'm very like, you know, I'm very, very simple, mm. you know. But still, I was still putting expectations on certain things. And if these things don't perform, behave or show up that way, then I would be miserable. Mm. And then that your happiness was reliant on other on people something or going, something else, right? Going, going based on my my uh, version of perfection, right? You know, right? But then when you stop and say, okay, well, this is my version of perfection, but what is that person's or that thing's version of perfection? Yeah. To them, that's perfect, right? So how can I live? How can I coexist with that thing the way it is, and still find fulfillment within myself, right? Yeah. And when you're able to do that, life you kind of have a different perspective on life. Like life kind of changes colors, like kind of like a, a new filter that you've never seen before. And it's right. pretty cool actually. Dude, this is such a great topic and we could go on forever. But before I do, I want to fill up the gap between restaurant 20 year old Bashar and starting up your own education company, starting up your own Amazon FBA business, Bashar. So yeah. what actually, how did your restaurant <clears throat> business actually unfold? And what happened to it? Why did you leave it? Why did you decide to start something else? Well, I didn't leave it. I mean, it, I got kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so six months in, I realized that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Yeah. And this was, uh, it, 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 it broke out for me in terms of, in a way of, I was driving to my restaurant from my house, which was about 10 minutes away from my restaurant. I got a call from Trish. Trish said, hey, Bashar, the bank just called. They said the check bounced. I'm like, check bounce? What do you mean check bounce? There's plenty of money in the bank. This is definitely not that. Well, is there something wrong with your, was your name not spelled correctly? She's like, no, they said it's insufficient funds. I'm like, okay, there's gotta be a problem here. I'll call you back. I got to the restaurant. I, I don't know if I, if I had mobile banking or I logged in somewhere. Anyways, I went to the, my, to my um, bank and I was negative. And then I started looking over and it's like, well, how could you not know how much money there is in the bank? You know, like which, what business owner doesn't know? It's like, well, yeah, that, 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 that tells you how much skill I had, you know, <laughs> being a business owner. Um, so that's when I realized that, holy shit, I don't have money in the bank. I still had not remodeled my restaurant. I bought it and it was a rundown place. Yeah. I needed to remodel it still. In my mind, I was thinking it's going to cost 50K. I don't have nothing in the bank. How am I going to do that? Because this place, the way it is, it's not going to get me to where I want it to go. Because again, I bought it as a rundown place. About a couple of weeks later, I, um, I was on a call with, uh, what was his name? John, John, the contractor. So John, uh, John, if you're watching this, screw you because you <laughs> screwed me. Uh, but John, um, I'll make sure his John name. watches this. I forgot his name. I, I would have shouted out his name, but his last name, I mean, but I forgot his last name. Um, <laughs> he, so I got a call. It was 10 o'clock at night after yeah. we closed, and, um, and we were going to go over our budget for our construction. And uh, I, was, I was expecting $50,000. So after about 30 minutes of ta him taking me through the budget, it was 235000 to remodel the to remodel the place and 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 with all with all like with all you know with credit to him yeah it needed that much right in my mind I that was 50, really 000. run down yeah yeah oh dude <laughs> oh dude I mean the bathrooms you walk in there's a there's a toilet there's no stall there's like holes in the wall and stuff like that it was like a really bad place that's crazy yeah yeah dude. it was like a biker's bar you know it was like oh, really right. yeah really bad. then it's all right I suppose <laughs> yeah 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 and um. And so that's when I truly realized that I, that holy shit, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Um, anyways, fast forward, 
we remodeled the place. Um, Wait, so, so you forked over 230 grand? No, 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 no. I picked up a hammer. That's what happened. <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, yeah. So, so I created a crew, my brother and my cousin, yeah. and then two of our cooks. Um, every night, so for about three weeks, what yeah. we would do, three to four weeks, what we would do is we would close the restaurant, remodel overnight. Mm. I would send everyone home, and then we would open. Three times per week, I went two shifts with an overnight remodel. So two nights per week, two, three times per week, I would work 48 hours, no sleep Damn. at the restaurant. So I'd go open, close, remodel, clean, open, close, go home and sleep. Dude, that's crazy. Right. You're no stranger to hard work. No, no, no. And, uh, and for, the, for, the whole hundred, uh, for the whole three years that I had the place, I was working about 120 hours a week. That's insane. Like this was like normal. I was working between 16 to 19 hours every single day. <clears throat> And, uh, and so I learned how to lay tile. I learned how to frame walls. I learned how to uh, uh, set, you know, slabs of concrete. I learned everything. My best friend was YouTube and my cousin because he worked in construction and we just made it happen. Right. Uh, we needed like a bunch of permits and stuff like that. I was just like, screw that. Put, you know, put, uh, 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 put, cover the windows, remodel overnight. No one's going to know what's going on when we wake up. No one's going to know what happened. And we made it happen. It, 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 was, it cost less than 50000 actually. Um, but, uh, we made it happen. So even after the remodel, I still remember the first day of our remodel, we had 2,700 people come through the door because that place was so run down for the longest time that this, the town was like a small town. Everyone knew everyone. The town was so excited that something new was going to come up. And honestly, we did a great job. Mm. It was like one of those like rustic places where you could tell that it's very rough. Yeah. And like, uh, kind of like, uh, like your cousin and brother put it together, but it, you could feel the, 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 the love, mm. you know, it was like, like literally we would take, you know, these, these fence planks. Yeah. We took fence planks from our, uh, our walls in the back and we put them on the bars and we painted them and like did like all these cool designs. We right, created right. benches from them. We did all this cool stuff that was like very like scrappy, mm. but it was so cool. We gave it this like awesome feel. And until today, I still think the concept in my mind is probably awesome. So it was a country town. There was a rodeo right across the street. In what San Diego? In San Diego. was uh, uh, East San Diego. Okay. What I wanted to do is I wanted to bring country and give it also a, um, a, like a futuristic theme. So I wanted to bring like old and the new together. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I came up with the name The Bucking DeLorean. So let me explain. <laughs> We had the second mechanical bull in San Diego County. So we had a mechanical bull. There was a mechanical bull inside your Not restaurant. inside, it was outside. Okay. Yeah. So in my mind, what I wanted to do, because I wanted to bring back the old, like the Western and stuff like that, and yeah. I wanted something in the future, I was like, oh shit, back to the future. The movie. The DeLorean. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was so like, the fucking really? DeLorean, <laughs> yeah. what we were going to do is we created the frame of the DeLorean mm -hmm. that we were going to put on the back of the bull. Stop. Right. But then we ended up putting it in the bar. And it was super sick. So you'd come and you sit at the bar and there's a back of the DeLorean sticking out of the bar. It was sick and it had like, you know, uh, like fog and stuff like that. And like the, the back lights would like turn on and stuff like that. I had this like crackhead electrician that I found down the street that came and like would put it together for me. But dude, I'm telling you, it, it was so creative. It got put together. So awesome. Yeah. But I had zero knowledge in operations. Got it. Zero. Okay. My mind was walls. You know, cool stuff and all that shiny stuff. Objects. Shiny object stuff. Right. But you'd come and order a burger at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it would take an hour. Damn. And your break is an hour. I need to get back to work. You know? I sucked at operations. I sucked at the day-to-day -day stuff. I didn't know that. And because I was a visionary, I needed an integrator. Right. If I had found a partner, if I didn't have an ego, like now looking back at it, what I really should have done is I should have partnered up with someone that knew restaurants, that knew how to run restaurants. Mm -hmm. With my crazy ideas, we would have made it a success, mm. right? But again, too big of an ego. Uh, fast forward, April 28, 2015, was 5 p.m. was a Tuesday or Wednesday. I left to go pick up my girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, 5 p.m. So no one can say, you burnt it overnight and stuff like that. Um, I got a call from John. Hey, boss, the kitchen, the kitchen is on fire. We're like, all right, we'll put it out. How bad could it be? It's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. We're all outside. The fire department is here. So I texted my girlfriend, like, hey, can't make it. Drove back. Smoke out of the, the roof. Like five, six fire engines outside. <clears throat> Trying to run inside. No one is letting me go in. And um, 
and they're like, dude, the, the restaurant caught on fire. It's That's like, insane. Fucking caught on fire. This is 5 p.m. during during uh, 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 like business hours. Yeah. There was literally a full bar, full like there was uh, people in the kitchen, and we had old pizza ovens. They, they, they there was a gas leak, caught on fire, caught up with the boxes and stuff like that, and then just took off, and then yeah. they just couldn't stop it, and the whole kitchen went. Four months prior to that, I had stopped paying insurance. <laughs> no. Yeah. So because you have a uh, first, it was a historic building. Okay. Second, you have a bar, and and we had it was a big place. It used to hold like two hundred fifty people. So your insurance goes up, and they need like this two million dollar policy, this thing, this that. I was paying like twelve hundred fifty dollars a month. And I was paying it for like two and a half years, and I'm like, dude, I'm paying all this money. I could like, and I had like debt piling up everywhere, and I'm like, well, I can pay this guy, oh I can God. pay that guy, I can pay that guy. I'm like, what the hell is the worst gonna happen? Right. Four months later, the kitchen caught on fire. Of course it did. You know, if it didn't, dude, I would have made out so freaking big because I would have remodeled the whole place. I would have probably gotten so much money from insurance, you know, and I would have like really taken care of stuff. But my, uh, my, uh, my landlord who now I was like three, four months late on rent, this, he just had, he's like, all right, fuck it. This is it. And just like, get the fuck out of here. And it sued me for the remaining of the, of the lease because it was a five year lease. We had like two and a half, almost three years, into, two and a half years. And there was another two and a half left. Was I think three or 5,000 a month, something like that. So that times whatever, 36, 24, 36 months. He sued me for all that. I owed the IRS like 42 grand for like back taxes um, outside of like debt here and there, like credit cards. Uh, uh, I had two repos, two cards got repoed under my name because I couldn't pay those like Dude, a few months prior to that. how did you sleep at night? I didn't. I honestly used to think that sometimes I would go to sleep and not wake up the next morning because I would literally be so stressed out all day. I would have like my 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 eyes would be twitching all day. Dude, at that I would point, I would be headache. praying I didn't wake up the next morning. Yeah, I would have headaches That's all insane. day. That's insane. Yeah, like, so my employees never got paid on time for the longest time. Yeah. Um, I had uh, about three quarters of our food purveyors wouldn't deliver food or alcohol to us. I would like go, literally go into like Devon's and stuff buying in Walmart buying alcohol because I couldn't get from the companies anymore because I had so much racked up debt and I just couldn't pay. Right. Um, I would like go shopping from like stores and shit because again, I couldn't buy from cool thing. Not cool thing, but funny thing. I used to go to uh, Smart and Final and Smart and Final was the only place that even if your, if your debit card is like they will let your debit card go over. Overdraft. Overdraft. So what I would do is every Friday after 5 p.m., I would go to Smart and Final, empty out my, my business uh, debit card, and I would go shop for the whole weekend and would rack up like $1,000, $2,000. But then by Monday, I would have all the deposits coming from the weekend and it would clear it. But at least I would have enough enough food and liquor and stuff like that for the for the weekend to, to supply the restaurant. Right. And it was something that I did every weekend. That's, Literally every weekend, you know? You were pretty... You were literally just shopping for inventory yourself oh yeah everything 100 percent. i was literally running around all day shopping for inventory from all these different places yeah because again the the companies where i'm supposed to be buying stuff from i just couldn't anymore too much debt with them too much debt with them yeah and so this was the this was the restaurant story and, and then from there six months after i i i was i mean i say that i got into depression i would i don't think i was 100 percent like depressed but i was like clinically you could say i was depressed uh, and then my my uh, uh, cure of choice was uh, Hennessy on the rocks, uh, and um, so I did that for about six months. I got a DUI. Uh, luckily, I got it the way I did because there were times where I would wake up in the morning and be like, "How the fuck did I get home?" So, but the way I got it, I wasn't that drunk. Uh, I was driving my buddy's car, so his car got impounded and had it had to, you know, bring it out. My girlfriend, again, was the, the, the one that saved me that time. Yeah. Um, Good thing for girlfriends, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, yeah, this was, this was rock bottom, man. This was 2015, about July, August 2015. And then I, after that, I, met, I saw a friend that I hadn't seen for a couple of years. And he's like, what have you been up to, man? I had a beard down to here. He's like, what have you been up to? I'm like, shit. A lot. What about you? It's like, I work from home. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> He's like, I work from home. I'm like, what do you do? What do you mean you work from home? What does that even mean? Like, I didn't understand what that meant. Yeah. He's like, dude, you know, there's this thing called YouTube. Like, and there's a bunch of stuff you could do from home. And 
I was like, no shit. Okay. So I remember one day I went home and opened my Toshiba laptop. I was like, all right, man, you're supposed to make me money. Show me how. And then just started searching all kinds of shit. And that's when I came across Amazon FBA. And this was late 2015. Damn. So what happened up until that point with all the debt, all the back taxes that you owed the IRS and everything? Nothing. So you still like, you were still in that position. No, no, no. Right now? No, not right now. Oh, yeah, like then, in 2015. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. This would take about three other years uh. to actually clear everything. Dude, until, until, um, until about a year ago is when I got my first credit card. I literally had like multiple seven figures in the bank and the bank wouldn't even give me a credit card because my credit score was so shit. And I, because you know how like things stay on your credit uh, yeah, for yeah, like yeah. seven years or something like that? Oh, that sucks. Well, I had two cars, two uh, repossessed cars. I right. had like charged off credit cards. Although I had paid them off, they still like they dinged my credit. So literally up until about a year ago is when I got my first credit card after like almost a decade. Dude, how did you get like, I don't know, how did you lease a car? Or... I, well, you... well, I, well, when I got married, she came with a car. <laughs> so, so that was that. Um, yes. And then, yeah. And then, uh, you know, we, we drove a Honda Accord for like a couple of years when we first got married. And then after that, we got a... Uh, you, you had a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. Uh, a Bentley. So that was, so yeah, I bought that cash. Okay. Yeah, because I, I couldn't uh, couldn't finance. Um, but dude, that's a whole other story. <laughs> why that even was a thing. And then we got another car that we leased under her name. Okay. And then now our car I leased. So, I mean, that was a different story. Okay, so 2015, you start your... You basically get into the world of online businesses. At that point, like... How do you go from that Amazon FBA to starting up your own coaching business? <clears throat> so uh, December 2015, I had found out about this thing called arbitrage, where you can buy stuff on at a store and yep. then sell them on Amazon for a, for a, for a profit. So I it was uh, it was Christmas it was Christmas season, and again my girlfriend came for the rescue. So what we would do is we would take her mom's SUV. And we would drive around San Diego. I found this toy that I could buy for like 20 something dollars, sell it on Amazon for 42 bucks. Now I didn't profit 20, 30 bucks. I profited about 12, 14 dollars after fees and all that stuff. Yeah. And I still remember the first day I woke up and I opened my, my app and there was a sale for 42.99. And I was like, holy shit. This works. I made money while I slept. <laughs> to me, that was a concept that I couldn't understand. Yeah. Because... Like, I know now it's like, oh, yeah, you know, like, you know, don't even think about it. But it's like, dude, to be able to make money as you sleep, while you sleep, it's stupid. It's literally stupid. Yeah. You know, because for me, it's like I had to shop for the food, store it, clean it, prep it. That's a whole new serve world. It, clean after the customer yeah. to make a $10 sale on a sandwich and a beer. But now I'm making a $10 profit. In my sleep, like my mind was blown. I was like, all right, if I could do it once a day, how could I do it five times a day? How can I make sure I may do it every day? Okay, one side of that, it's like, all right, how do I do that with multiple products? How do I do that now? You know, and then I started just doing the math and I was like, holy shit. But then what happened was that that concept became very not scalable because I was driving around stores all day long. And then there was one toy that after December, it just people weren't buying it as much. And I was like, well, holy shit. It took me like... I don't know, maybe like two months to find that toy. And it's like, well, shit, every two months I'll find one product and it'll sell for a month and then I don't have unlimited supplies. It's like, and I started going to, to and then I found out about Alibaba and I found out they, I can talk to manufacturers. I'm like, hey man, can you manufacture the same exact toy for me? It's like, yeah. So I, I got the sample and then I showed it to my wife and she's like, well, girlfriend at the time. And then her cousin or someone was like, hey man, you can't do that. I'm like, fuck you mean you can't do that? It's like, well you can get sued. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you're selling someone else's product because I manufactured it the same. Like, was it fake one? Oh, they just literally copied They it? copied the whole thing. Oh but God. I wasn't thinking that way, you know? And I was yeah, like, yeah. all right, well, fuck. I, I guess I got to go to the manufacturer, like to the actual company. And I could not get to them. I tried to go to, to distributors and stuff like that. And I just couldn't get them. I'm like, all right, there's got to be an easier way. I'm like, wait, I'm talking to the manufacturers. There's got to be something I can do with them I can sell on Amazon. And then I found out about this whole other thing called private label. Mm. And I was like, okay, well, that's cool. I know how to get to manufacturers. If I just know what kind of product to sell, they'll make it. And then I'll have unlimited supplies. Holy shit. I don't have to drive around. I can just go to them. 
you know, they buy it. They ship it directly to Amazon, Amazon stores. I was like, oh my God. Like, dude, when I, re- like when that thing became real to me, yeah, that's when I was like, holy shit. Because again, see, I come from a different world. So comparing this experience, like now, kids nowadays look at this and then they're bitching about it. Oh, well, it's taking a month to get to Amazon. Well, Amazon takes five days to unpack everything. I'm like, Dude, are you fucking serious right now? You make money while you fucking sleep. Do you know what I used to go through to make sales? <laughs> like, dude, I was, first of all, I was limited. Yeah. I would be crazy to see a customer walk in before 12 o'clock. Yeah. You know, or someone stay for more than an hour and have more than three beers. Like, are you insane right now? And so I come from a completely different world. So when I saw this, dude, I was, I was mind blown, you know? And then about two years after that, I just kind of went into my cave and just focused on that. Like I blocked all of my best friends, literally blocked them. Why? Well, one of them because I had borrowed money from and I just couldn't <laughs> pay him anymore. I just couldn't pay him. And I was like, hey man, you just got to give me some time. And then he kept on like being like more persistent. I'm like, you know what? Fuck you. I'm just going to block you right now. <laughs> um, and then they would hit me up to go out and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, blocked. I'm not about that. You know, I blocked all my cousins. I changed my number at the time. I blocked everyone. So you literally became a different person. I became a different person because I just literally had to focus on me. I had to focus on me. And then prior to that also, I started... So right after the restaurant, I was uh, getting threatened by my employees for like two weeks Mm -hmm. because they would literally text me like, if I see you, I'll beat your ass because they weren't getting paid. I didn't... And it wasn't because I didn't want to. I didn't have money in the bank to pay them. Right. And I was like, guys, like this is my bank account. And I think to them, they just couldn't understand. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You've got all this business... You have no money in the bank. Like, they didn't understand what was going on, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, And so I was like, all right, I got to figure something out here. I started working at Hilton Hotels as a dishwasher. And then I started driving for Uber. And then once I found out about Amazon, I would literally have my laptop next to my seat. And in between Uber, as I'm, like, waiting for the next ride, I would pull it up, hook up my, my hotspot, and, like, start looking for a product. So, like, talk to suppliers or whatever. Yeah. And I did that for, like, six, seven months um, until I dropped my... Um, my dishwashing job, <clears throat> stayed with Uber. I did Uber for like almost a good year or so. Honestly, Uber was like one of those things. Like I used to think even if I make $10,000 a month, I won't give up Uber. I was making about $3,200, $3,500 a month. But it was an awesome thing because right. I could do it on my own terms. I was making such cool... Re- I was like... I was the kind of Uber driver that will not shut up until you... Like literally, I would either have people like put on their headphones or just be like, hey, bro... I just need to get to my place, please. Can you like turn up the, the radio or something? I would literally like just talk to them. Yeah. And I would like, you know, uh, get their numbers. What do you do for a living? Blah, blah, blah. It's like just building. Just networking. Com- yeah, building yeah, yeah, yeah. networks. I didn't know why. I just knew that it's a good thing. Yeah. You know? Uh, and I think also it was a way for me to like get distracted from my misery pretty much, you know? Like, so I don't have to sit in my mind and think about the shit. Mm. Um, and then from there, a couple of years after, man, I, after I came out of my cave, you know, a few friends were like, where the hell have you been? What the hell have you been up to? This. And at the time, I was probably making, I don't know. I know I was making probably about like good 15, 20K a month in like profits. Like mm. profits. Now with Amazon, you're not actually taking that home into your bank account. Wait, how long ago was this? Like after so you started? This was, uh, so this was 20, late 2018. So this was about three years into the, 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 con- into the entire thing. Oh, three years into Amazon FBA? Into Amazon FBA. You're making 15K a month in profit? Yeah, so my business was probably making anywhere between 60 to 80 grand a month yeah. in, in sales. And I was profiting about, you know, 15, 20K. And, um, and that's when, when like people, like when I would tell my friends, because everyone that I told yeah. thought I was lying. Because they're like... Dealing drugs. They're like, wait you're a second. You're a drug dealer or something. What are you talking about making 15... Like, they, they didn't understand that. You know, because all my friends worked at like gas stations, liquor stores, car washes, blah, blah, blah. Right. They're making three, four grand a month if they're lucky. Five grand, it's like, holy shit, I'm like making it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm here telling them how I'm like working from home on my laptop all day, making 15 grand a month. They're like... What the fuck are you talking about? So you about? just, at that point, you just quit Uber and everything else, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at that point, it was just stupid to, to yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, continue d- d- that. Yeah. I just did that for, for, for like a good year. About 2017 is, uh, is when I quit everything and just kind of focused on Amazon. Okay. So here's a question for you. What was the biggest mindset shift from your 20s to like in 2018 when you're making some real money, you know, and you started making 15K a month and 20K a month in profit from the Amazon FBA <clears> business? <throat> what shift allowed that to happen for you? Uh, scarcity. It was, um, it was, holy shit, I'm in debt, 
I've met someone that I care about that I feel like is the one, but I'm no financial position right now to provide the kind of life that I want. My father is disappointed and I need to gain his respect back and I need to make up the loss. You know, mm-hmm. I was still living with parents. I started picking up some, some payments. So that kind of eased my relationship with my dad a little bit. I started paying for rent, started paying for this, started paying for that. So it kind of woke you up. It did. That was an increase in awareness, like you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. It stunned you into awareness. It it's like, was, holy shit, what the fuck am I doing in my life? It was. And the biggest shift was being clear on my why. So I get this question all the time mm. is, I want to start a business. What's your, big, what's your first tip? And people are like looking for me to give them a tactical tip. Right. And I'm like, be clear on your why. Yes. And then they Absolutely. look at me like, get the fuck out of here. I'm out of here. You know? And so when I tell people to be clear on their why... I didn't even know that until years later. Right. Now when I look back, it's like, yeah, I had a clear why. I knew exactly what I want. I knew the outcome. The outcome wasn't 10 grand, 15 grand, 20 grand a month. The outcome was respect back from dad, take care of family, be able to get married, clear debt. Very clear. That's what I was focused on. That's it. Amazon was a vehicle. It could have been something else. It could have been drug dealing. It could have been whatever. I could have become a prostitute. I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I I'm did. so glad you're not. Yeah, it doesn't matter. With the stash, it With the work. stash, it work, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, it, what I would have done. It was just, this is the outcome that I want. Yeah. So I, was, I became very clear on my why. Because there would be days where I would wake up and my, my freaking listing got suspended. Or my entire account got frozen. Or my supplier told me to go fuck off. Or shipping you know, went from... $2 a unit to $5 a unit and all my profit went. Right. You know, or money got stuck at Amazon or, you know, or just someone just would throw a wrench in my face and like get a lawsuit in the mail out of nowhere from something that I did two years ago. You know what I mean? Or some mm. shit like that. It's like, where the fuck did this come from right now? You know? Yeah. And all these things. And so turbulences will happen all the time, whether you like it or not. You know, if you are clear on your why though, that's going to be the thing that's going to pull you in the future. Right, so that's very important that you become clear on your why. So for me, the mindset shift was I became clear on my why. I didn't know it then, but now looking back, and so this is why every time now I want to do something, I become clear on the why, on the outcome. You know, right, right. What is it? Right. And usually, you don't want it to be attached to you, into your personal benefit. You want it to be attached to something bigger than you. Mm. And this is why now with BJK University, I have so much drive that it's like. Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever the hell is going on, it's just another day in the office for me. And I love it. Right. You know, I wake up, I do my morning routine, I do my exercise, I go to work, and then I just love it, you know? And I'm able to drive others in the same way. Mm. That regardless what is happening in their lives, they can still come and show up and do the work and love it and enjoy it because of my vision and because of my drive for them as well. Interesting. It's so interesting you say that because the first thing we do when we work with our clients, and that's something I realized, is you have to have clarity. Mm. And clarity is not just intellectual clarity, like I want to make 15K a month. It's also emotional clarity. Yeah. Knowing why do you want to make 15K a month? Yep. What is it, that thing that's bigger than you? Like, and also, it's, I also realized like when you give, it's much better than just receiving, uh-huh. right? So it's, it's got to be much larger than yourself, like a <clears> mission <throat> that, that moves you every single day. Kind of like Elon Musk and his, his desire to have a colony in Mars. Yep. You know, that's his one metric that he uses. Like, what do you want? Mars. Is this decision going to help me move one step closer to Mars? Free economy? Like, yes, do it. No, eliminate it. Right. That's his one metric of judgment. So it's very interesting that you say clarity and knowing your why was that main shift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 2018, Amazon FBA. How'd you get into coaching? So again, when I came out of my cave <clears throat> for about a good six months there, you know, you don't know you're doing good until people tell you. Yeah. And then when people keep telling you that you're doing good, then you believe it. Mm. And then when you believe it, that's when you get in problem, you get in trouble. And this is why for me, you know, we're on a mission to impact 1 million lives. And right now, our mission is to fix people's financial problems so that we can allow them the space to think about their passion. You know, people talk a lot about, like, you hear Gary Vee. If you know, if you figure out your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. I'm like, go fuck yourself, dude. <laughs> if I'm in debt and I've got debt collectors calling me, like, how yeah. am I going to think of my passion? Now, look, if I picked up a paintbrush when I was two or if I picked up a soccer ball when I was five... And that's different. I've got a skill. I was born with it. But I, I'm not, I don't have any of those. You know? right. I mean, look at me. Right? I, I ain't got nothing. You know? So it's like, I ain't got no passion. I was in debt. 
to find your passion, you've got to come from a place of abundance. You can't come from a place of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And when you are struggling to make ends meet, trust me, you're not thinking about your passion. You're thinking of how to put money, you know, uh, yep. food on the table. Yep. Right? How to make sure that the, 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 you know, you don't have too much month at the end of the month and that you've got enough money to feed your family. Right? Right. So I was in a place of scarcity. And oftentimes that's good. When your back is against the wall, that's good. But then you get to a certain level, that's when you need to make a shift. Because you're not, like, here's an example. One of our pod leaders, we had a problem. Here's his problem. Our sales reps are making too much money, bro. I can't get them to do follow-ups anymore. I'm like, interesting. It's like, that's an interesting problem to have, yeah. you know? I'm like, okay. He's like... I am the kind of guy that wakes up every day thinking that I'm, because he was homeless at some point in his life when he had a, a wife and a child. And he's like, I wake up every day thinking that I'm going to go there. So that's my drive. I'm like, okay, how much are you, how much did you make last month? Like it was like 25K or something like that. I'm like, how long do you think this is going to last? Because there's going to get to a point where it's like, you've got multiple six figures in the bank. Like, you know, you're not going to become homeless tomorrow. You know, like it's like, even yeah, if yeah. you lost your job tomorrow, you know, you're, you probably have a couple of years of, of, of leeway to like figure the next thing out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's when the mindset needs to shift from, holy shit, I'm going to go. Like right now, I know I have enough to last me about 15 years if I do nothing. Mm. Literally, if I earn zero income, as long as I keep my expenses the way they are, yep. I have enough to last me 15 years in the bank, right? Now, obviously, I don't want to wait 15 years before I figure out the next thing, right, you know? Right, right. But what, like, like your you, business too, like everything. If my business shut, if I decide to shut down all my businesses and I have zero money coming in, right. As long as I keep my personal expenses at, at the same level, okay, I have 15 years in the bank. Gotcha. Right. So when I was talking to him and when I was thinking about where I was, I got to a point where everyone was like, dude, you're making 15 grand a month. Like, holy shit. And my yeah. mom was like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. This guy, you know? And then my wife was like, oh, well look at your, you know, like, you're making so much more than everyone around you and stuff like that. And I started believing it. Ego. And then before I know it, I'm at the beach drinking every day for four or five hours. Mm. And then before I know it, I'm kicking up my feet and then I'm resting on my laurels. Before I know it is I've made it at 28 years old. Like, holy shit, that's an accomplishment. I'm thinking that I'm about to get on like, you know, Forbes 30 under 30 and all this crap. Bentley. Like, Hell yeah. You know what Here I mean? Here comes the Bentley. And that's where the Bentley comes in, right? <laughs> So that's when I realized that I've made it in life. Yeah. And then I don't know what it was. It was like a punch in the gut. Uh, a couple things happened at the same time. Uh, one of them not being able to uh, 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 lease a car. And then that's when I went and, and, and kind of like went, uh, what's the word? Like uh, like pissed off shopping, I guess, and went and bought a Bentley uh, uh, cash. And then I, um, I think I was trying to open a credit card or something. I was trying to do something and then I couldn't do it. I was like, well, what the fuck? Then all this is for nothing. Like all this money that I'm making, they don't even give a shit about it, blah, 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 you know? Around that same time, I had been helping a couple a couple of friends of friends and I got a message from, from this guy that I was helping. A few people I was helping for free, a few people I was helping just like, you know, maybe getting like $100 a session or something like that just for the hell of it. Yeah. And, uh, and this guy was like, hey, bro, I made 36 grand in the last six months in profits. And that felt really good. But then what felt more, after I got off the phone with him, he was 23-year-old from North Carolina. His whole goal was that I want to ride my dirt bike around the country and then get into tournaments. Up until then, his thing was, I don't have, you know, I barely make ends meet. I don't have money. You know, if I travel, I'm not making any more money. Like, what am I going to do? Right. And this allowed him to do that. And this is when I was like, Amazon is probably not people's passion because it wasn't mine, but it can help people find their passion, mm. right? So it's a vehicle. You solve your money problem so that you have time and you have, you know, attention to go f find your passion or focus on your passion. And that's when I realized that I have a skill and that I'm obligated to share it with the world, right? And then from there, it just became a thing, man. And I just became obsessed over seeing the transformation. Like right now, it's kind of like I'm addicted to it. You know? Right, right, right. Like if I if I don't see like a big wow like per week, it's like I start digging for it. You know, like I'm now I'm like used to like just seeing them fly by. You know, like yeah, either yeah, from yeah. the team or from the community or whatever. We have so many people in, in both uh, uh, areas, 
if like a week goes by and I don't have like like a big like holy shit, like not like oh I made ten thousand dollars a month or something like that, but more like it's pretty holy shit. It is, but it's like, but that's, again, that's the other thing. It's like you get numb to it. Right, you know? right, right, right. And, but now it's like, you know, I was able to buy my mom a car or I put a down payment on this or, you know what I mean? Like big things. Right, right. Or like, you know, I quit my job. Like this is the biggest one for me. Hmm. Being able to quit their job, you know, with our team or, or, or community. I start like looking for it. It's like, it's like fuel that I need to, to kind of keep going, you know? But again, I've been on this mission for three years now. And I am more fired up today than I ever was in my life because it's not even about me anymore. Mm. It's not even about my team anymore. Mm. It's about a greater good. It's about a bigger thing than all of us put together. And it's about making that big impact. And again, for me, it's I want to start with people's money problems first, but then my vision, my five-year vision is I want to tackle other areas of their lives because I feel like when you start making money is really when the real problems start happening, not when you don't have money. That's when you start to realize, holy shit. Yeah, holy shit, I have money. Ego starts showing up yeah, yeah, and you start yeah, yeah. getting in real trouble. Mm. That's amazing, dude. Mm. That's crazy. So, 2018, 19-ish, you fully commit to starting up a coaching business? Yeah, early 2019, yeah. Okay, so 2019, startup coaching business, 2022, 2 million a month. Yeah. 20K a month, 2018, 2 million a month, 2022. What were the big, like the biggest, what was the biggest mindset shift that allowed that to happen? <clears throat> a couple of things. It went from it's for me to it's for other people. Because for me, 20,000 is more than enough. Yeah. You know, it's for other people. $200 million a month is not enough. You know, because it, now it's about providing opportunity. Mm. So now what I've realized is that the bigger the company gets, the more people I can employ and provide them opportunity because I know that they have better opportunity with me than anything else they do in their lives. So I want to get as many people in my company as possible. And then in, in turn, we can provide more opportunities to people out there because I know that we have the best program out there that teaches people the specific skill. Yeah. And I would rather them get into our program than any other program. I would rather them get into our program than put that money in some other dumb shit, like go on a vacation or right. like spend it on a, a, a Gucci bag or something, you know, because that's an asset. That's a liability. This is an asset. Right. Right. So you can sell a Gucci bag for an asset as an asset. Right? Dude, it's not an asset. <laughs> I, 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 I made the dumbass mistake to buy my wife a, a Gucci bag in like two years ago, two and a half years ago for her birthday. Yeah. I think I spent like $2,700 until this day. I feel that. Really? Yeah. She wore it maybe like five times and it got scratched up and then now mm. it's just sitting in the closet. It's, it was the dumbest thing that I've ever done in my life. Interesting. Literally. Interesting. Yeah. yeah it's funny you say that because my mom's birthday was in September. She's always wanted a Louis bag. Really? I just, I just bought it for her. Yeah. yeah I just, bought my mom. smile Louis. on her face. Dude. I bought just... my mom a Louis bag. She's never, she doesn't wear it. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. My mom carries it everywhere. Really? She, she well, that's good. That's so good. I, I was very happy about that. Hey, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. But, um... So it became about, it's not about me, it's about other people. Hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is, alone, you can go fast. Together, you will go further. So this is when I realized that I need people. Hmm. And I need great people. Hmm. You don't just need people, you need great people. And great people usually either, either have their own thing or are starting their own thing or are already in a great opportunity. To bring them into your own thing, you got to provide them with an incredible opportunity, number one, because people are opportunists, whether you like it or not. Yeah. Number two, you got to provide them with something that's bigger than you, bigger than them, bigger than everybody together. And once you have that vision created in that culture and that like that place that feels like home and that thing that drives them. Tony Robbins talks about the pull and the push. He talks about how motivation is something that push it, that you need push. Mm. It's like you're waking up every day, you're watching a Tony Robbins video and then that pumps you up. Yep. But then what happens when someone slaps you in the face, you fall. It's like you need another video to pump you up. Mm. But if you have something so large in the future that's just pulling you, doesn't matter if this guy smacks you, this you know, train runs you over, whatever happens, you'll get up and it keeps pulling you, right? There's nothing else I would rather commit my life to. That's right. It's, being, it's pulling you. It's just pulling you. Yeah. And so right now we have such a big purpose that's pulling all of us in the same direction that it's like it doesn't matter what happens today. So you know, over the last six months, we've had pretty turbulent uh, uh, um, six months in business. But we're more excited today than we've ever been because right. we know 
where we're going to be in five years because we know that it's bigger than all of us, that we know that, you know, this is just part of business. We're figuring it out as we go and we all believe in it. So that's the most important thing. Yeah, it's it's like I always <clears throat> tell everyone and also my clients, everything can be taken from a man. It's like that Victor Frankl quote, quote right. I don't know if you heard of it. Everything can be taken from man except his attitude. Right. The last of his freedoms. Yep. So as long as you keep your attitude in the right place, you know, everything goes wrong around you. You're getting pulled by your purpose, getting clear on that. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this goes back to that why. Yep. But your why is just getting bigger and bigger. <clears throat> yep. And it's something even more exciting that you want to wake up and commit yourself to every day. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think the last thing I wanted to talk about, and you let me know if you're comfortable sharing this. Um, I've seen you over the past six, seven months. When I met you, you were this old fashioned chugging monster to now you don't drink at all. Mm. And there was a significant life event that happened. And you know, you're wearing right now all black and you keep your life very simple. Your home is very simple. So just in terms of your lifestyle as this eight figure business owner, you know, how, I guess let's, let's start with that event that, um, maybe cathartic event that happened to you. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing a little bit about no, that. No, absolutely, man. I share, I share that every, uh, in every moment and every chance I get. So um, uh, May 21st yeah. was around 1 p.m. was a Saturday. We were walking down Publix and I started feeling dizzy. Um, I told my wife, I'm like, hey, I'm just not feeling good. It's something weird. It's like, yeah, you're probably hungry. I still remember we were pushing a cart. We had a bag of carrots. Like, here's a carrot. She just like literally shoves a carrot in my mouth. And then we're walking and then two seconds later, I'm like, babe, babe. And then everything shuts down. I just feel my body getting tensed up right as, as everything shut down. Mm. The next thing is I open my eyes and I'm being put inside of an ambulance. And then I, I was told that I had a seizure. And I was like, seizure, okay. But I'm not there, you know? And then maybe like 30 minutes later, I woke up and I was in the hospital and then things hooked up in my body and stuff like that. So I had a seizure, first time in my life. Over the following two, three weeks, I would sleep two hours per day. I was stressed out all day. Mm. I've launched nine businesses, seven of which failed. I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've gotten sued. I've been to jail. I've done all this stuff. I've been to jail. That kind of sounds cool. You know, I've been to jail. Um, none of this stuff put as much pressure on me as this. Mm. And I feel like now looking back at it, it's because when you're dealing with like business or whatever it's a tangible thing you can do something about it right, right. and especially if us like we've been doing it for a while with health it's like i'm 155 pounds about five nine five ten so i'm pretty thin we have a chef that cooks for us a couple times a week yeah i exercise four or five times a week and i eat pretty healthy so it's like why did this happen now if this happened five years ago and i was stressed out all the time I'd be like, yeah, okay, this makes absolute sense. Right, right. If this happened, this happened now, and it's like, dude, I'm like more obsessed about what I do. I'm like, I'm the happiest that I've ever, probably ever been. Why did this happen now? <clears throat> and then back in my mind, I've always felt like there was something wrong with me. Like I always had an underlying condition. And every time I would go and try to get checked for like blood or whatever, x-rays, always like, dude, there's nothing wrong with you, you right. know? And in my mind, it's like, holy shit, it's that thing. There's probably something wrong with me. And then my mind and it all, and this is probably a, a whole other podcast by itself, but um, it all starts, it all stems from a thought. And then that thought goes into another one. Mm -hmm. And then the thought goes into after, you know, I learned this. And again, that's why becomes I'm saying a belief, over the last... becomes a conviction. Right. Becomes that's why over the last six months, absolutely. Over yeah. the last six months, dude, I've learned so much about this stuff. It's insane. Um, but every thought creates an emotion that only lasts for 90 seconds unless another thought comes in that triggers another emotion that thought will go away that emotion goes away mm. but then when you keep adding thoughts to it after a few emotions then your physiology reacts right and then when your physiology reacts that's when you start feeling dizzy you're still feeling you start shaking your nervous system literally starts collapsing and so for me it started showing up in, in ways of panic attacks and to me i was thinking that i'm having other seizures and so that started playing with me. And so for the next two, three weeks, I would literally live on the couch yeah. like a dead vegetable. I would have a laptop in my, in my, in my, on my lap. I would try to get into meetings and I would have like panic attacks in between. I would like start feeling dizzy like I'm about to faint. Mm -hmm. I couldn't leave the house. If I left the house, I would have a panic attack and we'd need to come back home. I literally could not do shit. Mm. I would have meditation in my ears 
literally 24-7. I wouldn't be able to sleep. I wouldn't be able to do anything. And this went on for three, four weeks. And then I started working with one of our team. Was a, a, He's a hypnotist. And so he gave me an exercise. He literally hypnotized me and put me to sleep. And I started using that exercise over the following week or so that actually helped me go to sleep. Um, and then my wife was about to go. So I was actually in quantum. And I was like the virtual one before the, the, the in-person one. It's like, man, I wish this was in like two weeks from now. Why? Because my wife needed to go to Detroit for a wedding. And I was like, man, I wish that there was an event that I could attend that keeps me busy. I went to sleep. I dreamed that Tony Robbins had an event July 14th to July 17th. I wake up, I go to TonyRobbins.com and there's Unleash the Power Within July 14th to July 17th. I don't know how the hell that happened. It was weird. That's put me on a self-development journey over the last six months that if my seizure didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. I can literally say that I am a completely different person than I was six months ago. Mm. I've never been through such a changing self-development journey in such a short amount of time in my life. The thoughts that I think, the way that my awareness, my behaviors, the, the person who I am, is it, I'm not saying better. I'm just saying it's a completely different person than right, I was right. six months ago. Mm. Uh, and, and some of the perks is that I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke anymore. I gave up um, uh, 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 caffeine. So no more no sodas, coffee. no coffee, no tea, no energy drinks. That morning I had a monster and two teas. And so now if I have a monster, I probably have a freaking panic attack. So I, I don't even do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it's been, it's been an eye-opening journey. And the cool thing is the, these were two biggest crises in my life, the seizure and the restaurant burning down. Mm. And after every crisis, crisis that happened, I come out a completely different person. Right. So what this has done is it has built my resilience and my trust within myself like never before. Mm. Right now, I feel like I can go through anything. And I know that meanwhile, I will feel like shit. I won't want to wake up in the morning, but I have such confidence and conviction that with time, I will come out the other side because I've done it before. I've done it with financial situations. I've done it with health situations. And I feel like, this could be my ego speaking, I don't know, but I feel like I have such like an amazing tool belt that I can pull things out of right. that'll help me throughout. But that's the thing. And, and I have a saying right now. Um, I, there's a quote every month. I put a quote on my whiteboard that I live by for the month. And last month, two months ago, the quote was, thank you, life, for being difficult because it is through difficulties that we learn and grow. And so now every time I see a crisis, I get excited. Mm. I'm like, holy shit. Can you imagine what's going to happen? Like, I'm about to get even better. Okay. All right. I love that. You yeah. Know? It feels like shit in between, but I know on the other side, it's going to be completely different. Amazing. Mm. Tenets of the wealthy mind. Clarity <clears throat> on your why, <clears throat> attitude, and attitude towards hardship, embracing hardship and challenge. Yes. So I guess, you know, I think this is a great place to conclude this. If you were, if someone were watching this right now, they're in a circumstance in their lives where they feel trapped, they feel like they're not living their lives on their own terms, they don't know what their <clears throat> passion is, they're in that scarcity mode that you were at maybe back in the day, they're going through a lot of hardship. What advice would you give to them? Two things. Number one, I would say f be clear on your why. That's the thing that I tell everyone now. Be clear on your why. The more clear you are, the, 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 the further you'll go, the faster you'll go, the better outcome you'll have. And number two, have trust in yourself. You've gone here. You've gone through. I don't care who you are. Even if you were born into billions, you've gone through some shit in your life. And you've, got, you've gotten to this point. Trust that it's all in your mind mm. and that your potential and your level of awareness, it's what's keeping you from the next part. Mm. But it's 20% skill and 80% psychology. Right. And unfortunately, we focus a lot on skill yeah. and not a whole lot on psychology. And if you just take as much time, not even four times as much, as much time as you put into your skill building, into your psychology you literally will become a completely different human in 30, 60, 90 days. Mm. That's fantastic, man. Bashar, Appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much you. for being on. This yeah. was an absolute pleasure having you on. I learned so much from you today, dude. Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to apply what you've just taught me and change my life for the better. Like, you know, it's like you say, it's 
those five phrases or five words that you hear from someone and it just sticks with you. Yeah. So, 100%. Yeah, Thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this was helpful. For sure, I'm going to attach all of your socials in the description box below. Um, where's the best place someone can go One just, to find out? Yeah, me? Instagram. We're biggest on Instagram. Be sure it's the one that has the most followers because there's like a bunch of people trying to, you know, there's scam others that. and stuff like that. So yeah. add Bashar Jika to on Instagram. Follow us. Till next time.